opening. We have Michael Fallon for the Conservatives, and we have Caroline Flint for Labour, and we have uh, Jeremy Brown for the Liberal Democrats. And as ever on these days, uh, with his sharp take on what's going on, we have my colleague Nick Robinson, the BBC's political editor. Nick, we'll start with you. Just tell us what we might expect today, and is it going to be bold and ambitious or not? Well, I think what will be striking about it is what's been removed before Her Majesty reads it. There's a phrase used by the Conservatives' new election strategist, Linton Crosby, about brushing off the barnacles off the boat as it heads to a general election. In other words, removing plans for new laws that will upset voters, cause a row, and upset the Tory parliamentary party as well. So no measures on minimum alcohol pricing, no measures on plain wrapping for cigarette papers, no measures, thanks to Liberal Democrat intervention in this case, Case, uh, for a so-called snoopers charter uh, intervention on uh, electronic communications, for example. All examples of things the government wants to get rid of. And what it will try to do is say it's focusing on the really important things, the economy and immigration. Michael Fallon, is that a fair summary? Well, it's going to be a bold programme. It's going to be an ambitious programme. Uh, some of these things we're still consulting on and aren't actually ready for legislation, like minimum pricing and so on. But the really big stuff is what the government is concentrating on, which is jobs. Uh, making the, already announced that the national insurance cut will benefit over a million businesses. Half a million businesses won't pay national insurance at all. That will help them employ more people. And some radical measures on pensions and also on social care. Well, this is a radical government with still a big reforming programme ahead of it. Will you have a radical answer, Caroline? Well, David Cameron has promised change, and unfortunately things have got worse and not better. Apart from what you've said, Nick, which I think there has been a ditching of those policies for electoral reasons, I do think that what we'll be looking at today is whether we're going to see some significant measures to boost jobs, but also, I think, deal with the cost of living. Lots of people out there, real wages have been depressed, they're paying higher for their energy bills, their rail costs and everything else, and, you know, we'll be looking very strongly at that. And we've said there are certain things we could do in the private rented sector, on the energy uh, costs for people, but also rail as well, as well as jobs too. And the truth is unemployment, unemployment is higher today than when David Cameron became Prime Minister. Jeremy, when people see the, the list of bills, and we'll have it a little later, will they be able to identify things that your party has been explicitly responsible for? Well, it's a coherent, cohesive coalition government, and people should look at it as a package which has been contributed to by both parties. I mean, there are some that perhaps draw more on Lib Dem instincts, some that are... Uh, more derived from the Conservatives, but it's an overall package. I think, I agree with Nick, that the, the principal focus is on how we try and revitalise our economy, how we get the country back on its feet again, and how we get to grips with the colossal deficit. And the Queen's speech, <coughs> excuse me, will have measures to stimulate economic growth, help small businesses. But I think also, crucially, it makes quite a lot of big, bold, long-term decisions on things like care for the elderly, on things like pensions, which the previous government, in my view, ducked, and we have an ageing population. We have a lot of people watching this who are concerned about how to care for elderly relatives, for example. So the bill does have a lot of those measures, not just to deal with the deficit, but to try and create a, a fairer, more harmonious society many decades into the future. More to come. We'll have more contributions in a while. I want to take a look inside the chamber of the House of Lords. It's a splendid scene, the work of Barry and Pugin, opened by Queen Victoria back in 1847. Dominated, of course, by that canopy right at the end and the gilded work on it, which is really a splendid sight, and the pair of thrones. We'll have something more to say about the thrones a little later. But let's have a look at the peers who are gathering. Lots of familiar faces. Former Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Ian Blair, Lord Blair, who joined the House of Lords just a few years ago. Also here, the man who until fairly recently was Britain's top civil servant. Gus O'Donnell, Lord O'Donnell, who's there just on the right, and that's uh, Lord Levine, a former Lord Mayor of London, chatting to him before this state opening of Parliament. And we'll be having a little look at who else is there in a short while. The state opening for many is the high point of the year for pageantry and for precision and impressive ceremony. One of the most familiar customs, one of the most symbolically important, involves the parliamentary official known as Black Rod, Lieutenant General David Leakey, and I've been to meet him. No, this is where the real power lies. This is the government dispatch box in the House of Commons. This is where the Prime Minister answers questions every week. On state opening day, the members of the House of Commons are summoned to the House of Lords to listen to the Queen's speech. And the man doing the summoning is an officer known as Black Rod. He's a key player in the ceremony and the drama of the day. 
My lords, pray be seated. Everybody associates Black Rod with uh, knocking on the door of the House of Commons at the state opening of Parliament and thinks that uh, my job is part-time and ceremonial, but in fact, um, I spend the majority of my time delivering security for the House of Lords. That's my major responsibility. This is the famous walk down from the central lobby here yes. to the House of Commons. When you make this journey, what does it mean? This is an important bit of symbolism, um, uh, important for the constitution of the country. It's the only time in the year when the three constitutional components of the legislature come together. Uh, and I'm dispatched on order of the Queen to summon the members of Parliament to come to the bar of the House of Lords to listen to the Queen's speech. We're in the members' lobby of the House of Commons. When you approach these doors, they will be slammed in your face. Why? The real reason is in the reign of Charles I, the black rod of the day attempted to arrest five MPs and, uh, and the Commons took exception to that uh, as an exercise of exercising their independence of the Crown. We have some evidence of what happens on the day. And, and indeed, there's a damage to the end of the rod here and it had to be repaired a couple of years ago by the previous black rod. You need good aim. And you, you need to get good aim. And when you enter the chamber to summon the MPs, what are your thoughts? Two thoughts, I think. One is, one's got to get one's lines right. Um, uh, it's very important that these traditions and ceremonies are done properly and professionally. And I suppose another thought is that Dennis Skinner, uh, MP, is usually there. He usually has something to say. And uh, one's got to keep one's focus and make sure one's not distracted by him. Jubilee year, double dip recession, what a start. <laughs> Well, a taste of uh, Black Rod's work there, but um, as he was saying very clearly, most of his work is not this ceremonial business we'll see today. It is, in fact, to do with the serious business of security in the House of Lords. Let's go back into the chamber and let's spot who else is there eagerly awaiting the Queen's arrival this morning. There we have uh, Lord Fellows from the world of the arts. And uh, from the world of business, we have plenty of people, including Martha Lane Fox, the internet entrepreneur. Back to the world of entertainment with Fluella Benjamin. And then we have the former chairman of the Conservative Party, still a minister in the government, Baroness Vasi. And here in his first state opening of Parliament as Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. And then uh, also there we have the former speaker, of the House of Commons, Baroness Boothroyd. More from the House of Lords in a while. Let's go over to Buckingham Palace, the first of our carriage processions. And as I say, it's a new departure this year because for the first time in 17 years, Prince of Wales is attending the state opening of Parliament, not attending alone either, attending with the Duchess of Cornwall leaving the forecourt of Buckingham Palace in the glass coach. Prince of Wales, who last attended the state opening back in 1996, but he'd attended on 16 occasions before that. There's a lot of talk today about the symbolism and the significance of this visit. And they have a 12-minute journey ahead of them to get over to the Palace of Westminster. And we say a little more later on about the Prince of Wales' presence today and uh, their appearance in the Lords itself. Because there's a clue for you if you look at the far end. All eyes, of course, drawn towards the thrones. This is the great design that Barry and Pugin constructed, the great canopy and the pair of thrones underneath the canopy. The Queen's throne on the left, Duke of Edinburgh's throne, on the right. That's very familiar. What is unfamiliar is this new arrangement. Let's look over to the left because we have a pair of ceremonial chairs or chairs of state and they are for the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. Very close proximity there to the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And all of these things should be examined for their subtle differences. Have a look at the three white feathers there because of course that's the very familiar insignia of the Prince of Wales the fleur-de-lis as well, encircling it. And let's look for some of the subtle signals of 
status we have in this chamber too. Let's have a look at the thrones first of all, because Her Majesty's throne is fractionally higher than the Duke of Edinburgh's throne. That's always interesting to note, but that just tells you who's boss. And then if you look across to the left, we see that this symbol of status is repeated. If you look at the Prince of Wales's chair, fractionally higher. I think actually it's slight, there's a, the difference isn't quite as acute as the other one, but it's slightly less, and you can see that the Duchess of Cornwall is slightly lower. So these little signals are interesting to note at this stage. Here we have a dismounted detachment of the Household Cavalry, uh, otherwise known as the Staircase Party. This is one of the early stages of the ceremonial on State Opening Day. Lots of the uh, troopers on duty today, very young, some of them undertaking their first segment of ceremonial duty, but a very high-profile job for them on the morning of the State Opening. But they will be lining the staircase ready first of all for the Prince of Wales's arrival and then of course for the Queen's arrival. There will be a third sequence as well where we'll see the Imperial State Crown and other insignia also being brought up that staircase. So we'll be back there in a short while. Now someone with a great view of today's events, right at the heart of the Palace of Westminster is my colleague Sean Williams. Yes, Hugh, in central lobby here in about an hour's time, MPs will start streaming from the Commons over there. There are about 450, 500 in there today, according to the doorkeepers I was speaking to earlier. And they'll move towards the House of Lords. There isn't much room in there, as we've already seen, so it'll be a bit of a push to get them all in, and they probably won't all get in. But uh, three MPs who've already worked out their strategy for seeing the Queen's speech uh, this morning are here with me now, and it's Penny Morton from the Conservatives, Heidi Alexander from Labour, and Julian Hubbard from the Liberal Democrats. Uh, if we could just start with you, Penny, what theme, what message will be coming from the Queen's speech today, as far as the Conservatives are concerned? Well, I, I would like us to be uh, tackling those issues which have been been in the too tough in trade for too long. Um, we need to reform uh, our care system so people aren't having to sell their homes. Uh, we want to address the anomalies in the pension system which discriminate against people like carers and those with broken work records. Um, and with my Portsmouth hat on, I'd really like us to reform defence procurement and make better use of the budget that we've got in defence. Okay, but social care and pensions, two of the main things you'd like to see today. Heidi, if, if, if it were a, a Labour government putting forward a Queen's speech, what will be in it? Well, I think the key thing that matters to people at the moment is jobs, and I think we would want to see action um, on introducing a compulsory jobs guarantee for people. Unemployment stands at over two and a half million, um, with a million young people out of work. That's one of the key things that my constituents speak to me about. Um, I'd also think um, we would quite like to see the reversal um, of the 50p tax rate decision and introduce that for earners over £150,000. Uh, um, equally, um, action to tackle some of the you know the bad practices in the big energy companies where bills are going up the wholesale price of fuel may be going down but those are isn't passed on to consumers in their energy bills so, so those are things that you that. don't think are going to be in the Queen's speech today and you'd like to see it and um, Julian from the Liberal Democrat perspective is there a feeling that perhaps the Queen's speech will see the government moving towards the right with its emphasis on immigration and welfare reform uh, I don't think that will happen. We'll try to stop the Conservatives doing that. What we want to see is a drive for a stronger economy, but also a fairer society. And that means things which will deliver jobs. So the energy bill, which could support 250,000 green jobs, 100,000 jobs coming with high speed too. Also the work that uh, Steve Webb, the Lib Dem Pensions Minister, will be working on to fix pensions, to make them much fairer. Uh, Norman Lamb, the Lib Dem Health Minister, about care um, and how we make sure that people don't have to sell their homes. And also I hope some good bits for high tech business. We've already had um, announcements announcements that we'll get uh, uh, national in, uh, insurance rebates for people up to paying up to £2,000, which goes quite well with the income tax threshold. We've already lifted uh, millions of people out of paying income tax. Julian, Heidi, Penny, good luck with getting in the House of Lords. I hope you get a very good...